My name is uh, Ed Welch or Edward Welch. Uh, and I'm just a guy, you know, I really am. That's how I feel. I'm, I'm just a guy that loves God. Uh, you know, I've known you throughout the years because of course we've done music, we've done ministry. Um, and uh, right now, right, I'm serving as a youth pastor at a church here in a city. It's called City Rise, Missouri City, um, a church down there. Of course, a suburb of Houston. And uh, yeah, man, just just got a lot going on, man. Just 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 living a life, trying to give God glory. You know, you uh, you said we've known each other for a while. We actually knew each other in Mississippi, and so I think your journey and your story is an interesting one uh, because we both ended up from Mississippi into Houston, Texas. And so uh, tell us a little bit about that. What uh, brought you to Houston and what are you doing right now? Well, yeah, it was, you know, I'm in Mississippi and I'm the type of person that if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, and a lot of people, excuse me, a lot of people that I dealt with in Mississippi were like, you just got to get out of Mississippi. You know, nothing's really going on here. And that was, that really wasn't my issue. Um, I've moved around my whole life, actually. So I'm not really from Mississippi originally, but but I knew in my spirit, like, it's time to move, which, mm -hmm. like I said, is a lot for me because I was doing well in Mississippi. I was fine. Good job. You know, had my house, all that stuff. I was, I was good to go. I was comfortable. But I knew in my spirit it was time to move, and Houston was on my heart. Sure enough, uh, as I actually served in the military as well, I went overseas for a deployment, and uh, my, well, was she my girlfriend at the time? My someone that I was romantically involved with actually moved to Houston because when we met, we both, when we first met for the first time, we both said we were interested in moving to Houston, which was kind of, you know, ironic, but, but cool. And so when I went overseas, she moved to Houston. And so when I got back and I was like, you know, it's time to move. I already knew it was time to move. I knew when I came back, regardless of whether, whether she came or not, I knew it was time to move. And so when I got back from overseas, I started looking for jobs and things of that nature. And um, nothing was really turning up. And um, I'm literally walking to my office in Jackson. I have a brand new boss that I've only known for like a month or so. And uh, and the Lord told me to ask to, to work remotely in Houston. Wow. Um, and so I'm like, I don't have a real good rapport with this guy. I've been with this company for literally like 20 years, but I've known this man. This man is relatively new to Trustmark and I've known him for like a month. So wow. sure enough, I ask and and just God's favorite, he was singing my praises to the HR department. Yeah, let him go work in Houston. This is fine. He can do everything he does for me here. He can do it there. Didn't even ask me why. Just yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, so just a blessing from God that to be able to keep my same job and and just was like when you want to go, as soon as y'all let me. So <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, so I am, and you know, then came here, got married, and and yeah, here we are. That's that's wild. I mean, this was during the pandemic. Whenever you uh made that transition, or no, 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 it was it was actually July 2019. Oh so wow! Moved, so yeah, I moved here July 2019, like literally the weekend of the fourth, that that holiday weekend. I yeah, moved, I'm here, and uh, yeah, then I'm looking for a church home. And then sure enough, and of course, you know, it's, it's Houston. There's tons of churches everywhere. And that's what I ran into you. You know, yep. you were here, too, you know, and uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. And that just really hindered the whole church search. But either way, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's wild, because when you when you had said you were working remotely, I mean, most people nowadays, they say that because of the pandemic. And so that happened before the pandemic. And yeah. it, it brought you here. You were able to come here, which is crazy. And yeah, we I was preaching too that day, which is wild because I'm a church planning resident. So I don't preach every Sunday. But there was this one particular Sunday that I was preaching and it wasn't even my home base, the church that, you know, I serve at. But it was one of the other churches and we ended up seeing each other. That was crazy. And then it was yeah. it was providential, too. I, I don't know if I ever shared this, but it was kind of during the time where I was still kind of questioning, should I continue doing music? And there's there's a couple of people that always end up in my life around those points where I'm like, I'm not sure if I still want to do it. And the two people that it's normally is you and MOG. And I don't think y'all ever known that. But no. every time I've been like right there of saying like, I'm done. 
like one of you guys have been in my life, either encouraging me or saying something or just being present and it reminding me that, OK, this is this is something the Lord has called me to do. So let me not put it up. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I felt like it was a low key, just kind of busting you out because you went ghost on me. We were both I in Houston. I was like, I was like, <laughs> this and I'm just randomly visiting <laughs> churches. And then I'm like, and then I'm like, oh, you feel bad about not calling me now, don't you? And That's <laughs> funny. That's funny. Yeah. Lord was up to something and I wasn't listening. <laughs> But but I, I'm I'm grateful that that didn't stop anything and that we still have a relationship despite my flakiness. But uh, <laughs> it's been crazy, man. This pandemic and then I can't blame everything on my kids. But you know, a parent will always try to do that. <laughs> yeah. you know, but um, I mean, man, I, I I really wanted to have you on because I know you you've got this unique connection, uh, not only to music but also to ministry. And like you said, you're you're serving at a church now and uh, even going to school. And, uh, you know, I really thought about you in a lot of different ways that we'll talk about today in regards to ministry. And I think it's always cool and interesting whenever you're talking to somebody that's in ministry or really e even in music as well to kind of hear their background of when it started. And for ministers, for most, there's this call to ministry. Um, when would you say you got that call to ministry and for you, what does that mean? I was 15 when, wow. I, when I accepted my call to ministry. Um, crazy, I guess, random story. Literally, I was, I was like 15 years old, 14, 15, 16, somewhere around there. And I would go to bed and I would hear a sermon. Hmm. And I instinctively knew it was me preaching. <laughs> Yeah, And so I was like, that's me. Like I heard a sermon, but it was my voice. It was me preaching. And that was my side uh, that, that I knew I was actually called to preach. Um, at the time I was in Oklahoma and uh, I was in a real small uh, uh, storefront like church actually, but the pastor there had a heart for youth. And so literally I was preaching to adults at 15. Uh, mm. So that was literally when I had my first sermon, I was preaching as, as a teenager to adults, not to youth, not to children, to adults. I was like Sunday morning, they gave me an opportunity to preach. So I literally started preaching at that age. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about it. You said you you were hearing sermons. So were, were these like audible sermons or is this like in your mind you could see yourself preaching and and there were sermons that were coming to your mind? Because that's why yeah. I'm just trying to flesh it out a little bit. It was it wasn't a vision. It was I heard the sermon. I it was it was just like not not audible, but I heard it in my mind. Like yeah. in my mind, it's like I'm I'm literally just laying in my bed, pitch black, just trying to go to sleep, and this sermon is just coming to my mind, and I'm thinking, wow. and as I'm and it's just like and it and it was just it was flowing like I'm literally thinking of scriptures and. And things of that nature and and i mean the, the sermon was just flowing and uh, and so that was and it happened more than once and so i was like there's something to this and uh you know i was able to uh talk to my mom and, and, and talk to my pastor and get some spiritual guidance of, of yeah i think you're right to be able to affirm that call on me at a yeah uh, let's talk about that a little bit because uh, uh i think this interesting and, and we can only talk about our experience, right? And so we're both African-Americans, black, black men, and we grew up in the black church, or at least that's what I'm believing was the case for you. And typically in the black church, when you do have that call to ministry, uh, there's not really any type of formal training that comes with it. And, and maybe your experience might be different and you could tell me if, if so, but it's typically kind of throw you in the fire, if you got a gift, if you got, we're going to give you opportunity. Uh, but it's kind of trial and error as you go and you kind of are empowered to do these things to get opportunity. For me, I had to become an armor bearer first and then I had to kind of work my way up in the ranks. And then it was just kind of, hey, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. Uh, here's your opportunity. One Saturday night, the pastor hit me up and was like, you preaching tomorrow. And I'm like, tomorrow? Um, you didn't want to give me no time to just kind of you got to be in you got to be ready in season out of season 
was that was that kind of your experience or did you have formal training? Uh, what what was that like for you? I'm so sorry, brother. Nah, man. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> um, no, um, I've, I've never had experience quite like that. Um, and to, to speak to the first thing you said, I've been, I'm blessed to have a lot of different experiences. I've been in, in majority Black churches. I've been in predominantly white churches. I've been in racially mixed churches. So I've, I got a good, I've experienced and big and small churches. So I've, yeah. I've seen a good bit of it all. Um, so that first experience when I was a teenager is the closest I could say is something I'm like what you're saying, but I still had time to prepare. Yeah. So like, you know, in fact, I came with a word. It was like, I have a word. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, put that thing together and, and we'll, we'll get behind you and support you. So that, that is kind of, I guess, being thrown into the fire, but just giving me an opportunity. But now where I really cut my teeth in ministry was, was after I moved to Mississippi. Uh, mm. shout out to uh, New Horizon Church um, Come on. And, 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 and I mean that's definitely a predominantly black church and it's not like that there was there was definite training like there was there was there were steps in, in training you had to do to become licensed and literally you had to go before a council and get grilled afterwards and you know oh, before wow. they licensed you and uh, the same thing with getting ordained Actually, no, I don't know if we got grilled before getting licensed, but definitely before getting ordained, uh, you know, there, there were classes we took, there were, there were opportunities to speak and, and things of that nature. So you really got your hands dirty in, in, in ministry and in preaching, because yes, there's a difference, um, you know, on that. So that, that's kind of what I, what I come from, being able to, to get my hands dirty and, and serve um, yeah. and also have have speaking opportunities. Of course, I, I can't speak for New Horizon nowadays. It's been it's been a long time since I've been there. But at yeah. the time I was there, there were a lot of ministers. So yeah, yeah. times of preach were kind of few and far between, but you always had an opportunity to minister. Yeah, no, praise God for that 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 story too, to be able to say that. Cause I think that that is true, which helps me to to oftentimes go back to the reality of my experience not being universal. You know what I mean? And even when it comes to the black church, which is why this is an interesting conversation, is because I've realized that the older I've gotten, the older I've gotten, I've realized, man, there are a lot of things that, you know, I had said were were negatives and things that I felt like, man, like I hate, I hate this happened. I hate, you know, the church I was going to was like this, this and that. And then the older I get, I'm like, well, the Lord used that. Well, God was still good in that. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for that. And there were some men of God who like, I'm like, man, I wish I had them in my life today. Um, and just that appreciation of, uh, you know, the black church that was absent for a lot of different reasons. And so like, you know, maturity is something uh, that, you know, we gotta, we gotta get as time goes on. Hopefully we get as time goes on. Uh, but yeah, I think you said something interesting um, in regards to, you know, just there have been a lot of ministers you felt equipped as far as to the task of, of ministry and, and preaching, but you said there's a difference there. Can you kind of speak into the differences between ministry and preaching? Well, you know what? Uh, something came to my mind and it may leak into answering that question because what you said, it made me think about something we assume a lot of times in the church. We assume you're called to ministry and you somehow automatically know how to lead. And that's not the case. There are some people who, they may be great preachers. Mm -hmm. They may be horrible leaders. Right. Um, and, and I think what, what your experience is, is almost like, uh, it's an example of that, of that sometimes you can have a pastor. He may be a great pastor. He, he may be a great pastor and have, a, and have a heart for people, all that kind of stuff. Not saying anything bad. Yeah. But Sometimes people can be good at something and not know how to teach someone else how to be good at it as well. It's not mm. automatic. Yeah. And so I, I think, cause I'm thinking about one of my friends right now who relatively recently accepted a call to ministry and being able to talk him through at the church where he's at. And it's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Like, all right, I'll let you preach. Let's test this thing out. And it's like, but you need training. You know, you need someone yeah. to talk through these things. That's the leadership side of ministry. Um, so now as I leak into that conversation of, of ministry, it's like, 
I mean, preaching is, is literally just, it's public speaking. I mean, I don't have to make it any deeper than what it is. It's, it's public speaking. And there's a skill and an art to that, um, that, that you can hone and work on and, and perfect and work on that gift. <clears throat> but ministry is everything else. It's everything outside of the pulpit. It's, it's, it's the youth and the children's ministry. It's, it's having those Bible studies. It's, it's making sure that not only are we reaching outside of the four walls of the church and doing evangelism, but what are we doing to, to strengthen and equip the body as they come? That, that is ministry. And it's not always in a preaching, you know, preaching is, is, is ministry in a broad sense because you're, you're speaking to a, a broad audience but ministry can sometimes be that one-on-one -on -one phone call. Um, you know, like right now, I'm a youth pastor. So, for example, and then I'll shut up. Like, of course, on Sunday mornings, I have, I have a youth leadership team. I have, uh, right now, two other, other adults that are under me and work with me as a team. And my most important ministry is really to those adult leaders. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, as the fivefold, what, what does the scripture say about the fivefold? We're there to equip the body for ministry. So I'm equipping them to do the same work. It's almost like I'm, I'm working myself out of a job. I want them yeah. to be able to run with the ministry without me even being there. So yes, on Sunday morning, I'm ministering to the youth. <clears throat> but throughout the week, I'm ministering and I'm pouring into them because they're yeah. helping me till this ground. You know, that's yeah. the ministry. Yeah. Hey, look, the platform is yours too, by the way. So never feel like you got to just be quiet like we we want to hear from you and so anything yeah. that you got to say or any any tangent that you want to go on go ahead the the floor is yours always so i'm i'm loving what i'm hearing from you as far as the diversity that you've experienced in regards to ministry and the different churches that you served at uh would you say that there were any differences there uh in the different churches and and let me just be frank let's just i want to hear your your thoughts and comments on the differences between being a part of the black church and the white church. And maybe you feel like there aren't any differences that you experience, but you experience them. And so I would love to hear kind of some of your thoughts on that. Um, you know, I just thought of this as you were, as you were asking that question, honestly, I just thought of this. Um, one of the weaknesses of the black church is that sometimes we, we fall prey to worshiping our pastor. Mm. Um, we, we, we put that pastor up on too high of a pedestal. Whereas sometimes in a white church, um, like the pastor, we don't even call the pastor pastor. We call him by his first name. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, there's a difference. <laughs> like I want a title. You're going to call me reverend or bishop or, you know, apostle or whatever this yeah. title may be. Um, and I think there's some cultural things behind that, which I don't know if I'm going to dig into today. But um, <laughs> but just to stick to the question, yeah. I, I, but outside of that, I mean, to be honest, a church is a church, man. I mean, as long as as long as we're really teaching the word, there may be some cultural differences. Obviously, there may be some different songs we sing and right. things of that nature. But but um, but even like like going back to uh, the church where I got licensed and ordained. Uh, like the senior pastor he was formally trained um mm. you know he went to school now some of the other ministers not all of the pastors were um but then in in a white church it seems like it seems like that's like that's like the norm that's the expectation um so that may be a little bit of a, a difference as far as just the, where the the standard as far as like how much have you really sewn into this as a minister how much have you studied and, and where's the proof you know like where's the degree to prove yeah. uh that you're dedicated to this? so that that's you know but I, I i back off of that to be cautious because it's like we're all only speaking from our vantage point right right I mean, right like you can't really say i hate to paint with a broad brush because i think that's a big problem with us today we paint with a broad brush we, if you voted for trump you're like this yeah you know, yeah. if you voted for Obama like this, if you believe in Black Lives Matter, you're like this. We're painting with a broad brush. And come on and now, bitch. Come on missing, now. You're missing the intricacies of, of the individual that are that are involved uh, in this. That's that's so good and so true, I think. And I think it's funny that you say that because honestly, when I was, you know, asking the question and when I thought of the question, 
you know, the reality is the black church and the white church are still broken. Um, and there's a guy by the name of uh, Brian Lee, who's a pastor in the city. And he, he told me this one day and he was just like, man, uh, you know, even the, the, the ugly bride of Christ is the bride of Christ. And uh, yeah. even all the brokenness that we see in the church, like it's, it's still the bride of Christ. And so um, this is something to, to, that, that's, that I'm mindful of often as well. Um, but one thing that you said about the black church, at least as far as your experience, uh, just kind of personally, uh, one of the things that you kind of pointed out uh, I think kind of bleeds into this next question um, because really for me, my experience was kind of seeing, uh, you know, just throughout the pastor being raised to a level or elevated to a level uh, that was almost godlike in a sense. Uh, like, man, this is his church. This is his people. This is his flock. Um, and you can't speak against the, the man of God. You know, there's, X, Y, and Z, and it was a lack of accountability that happened as a result of that. And there were just so many things that may have trickled in. And this is not just that one church in particular, but a couple of them that I experienced this at. And I think not only for me, but I experienced my parents going through church hurt. I didn't hit on it. Church hurt. And mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to hear kind of your experience with that, if that's the case. And if not, though, um, what would be some wisdom uh, that you would give somebody that is experiencing church hurt? And let me flip that. If you've experienced church hurt, how did you navigate through that? You don't go to Applebee's <laughs> and get bad service from one waiter or waitress and, and just boycott all Applebee's. Yeah. You don't. But yet we come to church and let's say there is, and, and please keep in mind, I'm not being insensitive to this. One of my pet peeves is hypocritical leadership. I will go to town. I will check anybody. I don't care if you outrank me in the church or you don't, I will clown you. <laughs> um, absolutely. <laughs> because that, that's a passion of mine. I, I hate hypocrisy, but, yeah. but if we're, if we're, like we said, if we're putting someone up on a pedestal, that's the only way that's really going to happen. So let me give mm -hmm. a little bit of my background and under, so you can understand where I'm coming from. Uh, and this may throw some people off uh, theologically, but we're just going to have to deal with it. Uh, my mom <laughs> is, is a minister um, and, and was preaching as a youth. So I, I, I am okay with women ministers. I'm going somewhere with this. When I was in Oklahoma, when I preached my first sermon, that was under a woman pastor. I've been in a church where the pastor was a woman. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, and my mom was like an assistant minister in that church. Um, so with that being said, I grew up part of part of my youth. I grew up with the with a kind of um, behind the curtain view of church leadership because you know the pastor is some. I'm over her house in between you know uh, you know in between Sundays. And she has a son that's my age. And so I was able to humanize my pastor and see her as an individual and see her as a person and not have her up on a pedestal. And so I learned that at a young age, I don't put people on pedestals. There is an extremely minute list of people that I literally look up to. Yeah. There are people that I, that I value. There are things that I, I can look at you and say, wow, man, I appreciate this aspect about you. You are better than me in that. But mm. to look up to you as an individual, it's like, man, we both people. I yeah. can learn from you, you can learn from me, and we're good. Um, so it's really hard for me to, and have I been hurt by a pastor before? Have I been disappointed by a pastor's leadership? Absolutely. Have I seen things in the church that is like, oh my gosh, that is wrong. That should not be happening. Absolutely. Did it hit me here? No, because I didn't have them up on a pedestal to begin with. There was, there was nowhere for them to fall from. All yeah. it did was tell me what I already knew. You're a person, yeah. you're a human. And, and, and so, I, you know, it, it is what it is. But I want to get to the second part of that conversation because church hurt is still, it, it's still a big thing, right? I mean, yeah. people still deal with that and, and, they, leave, and they leave the church. And, and they're, they're scared. I have a friend who I know 
literally, he um, he got married. He was, uh, him and his wife were getting counseling and his wife was cheating on him with his pastor. Wow. Like, that's insane. And that yeah. brother didn't go in church for a while. Praise the Lord. The, the praise report is now he is, he is remarried in church function, you know, serving God, but it took him years to recover from that. That's horrible, right? You expect yeah. leadership to have a certain standard. So I don't, I don't want to be little, please don't take that as I'm belittling church hurt or saying, oh, that doesn't exist. That, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but back to your second question of how do you really do it? For starters, you have to heal. Um, there's a process of healing, whatever you're going through, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, we have to get to a point to where we heal. You know, the world tells us this lie that time heals wounds. It's a lie. Mm. Time doesn't heal wounds. I know because there's a whole lot of old and bitter people walking this earth that yeah. are still dealing with hurt. Uh, maybe not necessarily church hurt, but some of them, yes, even dealing with church hurt, but they've never gotten over it. And at some point in time, you need to be able to take that hurt to your heavenly father and say, mm. God, this hurt me. God, he or she hurt me. God, these people mistreated me. And just like they did in the scripture, go to God. The mm. church is not your God. The pastor is not your God. And if you put someone up on a pedestal that they don't belong, then of course you're going to be off kilter when they fall from that standard. Um, yeah. And secondly, you have to forgive. Forgiveness, if you don't forgive, you, you get caught in a place of bitterness and resentment. And, and it actually festers in your heart and it keeps you from healing. You That's know, good. forgiveness, if, if, if you do something towards me, brother, and I don't forgive you, it's not hurting you. Mm -hmm. You're going on and you're living your life and you ain't thinking anything about me. Fact. I'm the one not forgiving you, holding that over you is actually tying, it's, it's tying myself emotionally to what happened way back when. If I don't forgive, I'm, I'm not cutting that cord. Forgiveness is a process of being able to cut that cord so that you can begin to heal properly. Um, thirdly, I got a few steps for you. Third, get a proper perspective. And it goes back to what I said earlier about the whole Applebee's. Look, you go to one McDonald's and they mess up your order. Maybe you, you had a husband and that one man cheated on you or that one woman cheated on you. That doesn't mean that all McDonald's are bad. That doesn't mean that all men or all women are bad. That means that the person you chose was bad. That means mm. that maybe that church you went to may not have been a healthy church. Maybe that leader should not be a leader. But that doesn't mean that the church hurt you. That means that someone who's supposed to represent mm. the church hurt you. So yeah. you have to get a proper perspective so that you can understand. Otherwise, you know, if you, I mean, who hasn't had a bad relationship? Does anybody ever say I'm marriage hurt? Well, some people do, and they just stay single, right? And they just, you know, <laughs> put up that emotional brick wall and just be single for the rest of their life. And, and they right. miss out on, yeah. on enjoying an abundant life. So, I mean, are you going to be relationship hurt for the rest of your life and just mm. not be in relationship with people? Um, next, throw away excuses. Mm. Some people are using that as an excuse. Some of you just don't want to go back. You're just being lazy. Let's, let's be real. Let, let's call a spade a spade because yeah. I, I bet you there's some people on your job that got on your nerves. I bet you there's some people on your job that may lie on you to your boss. I bet you you still go to work. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's just some of these things that you have to be able to, to, to be able to tell yourself the truth. If people stop you from living your best life, then you've chosen to stop living because of them. If you just don't want to go to church, say that and stop blaming other people for your personal preference. Like, I, I can't let somebody else be my God. Like, no, I, I'm living my life. Um, I may go there in a second. Uh, you know what? Yeah. Okay. I'll go to my next one. Live for God. You're not living for man. You, you're not, you're not doing this for an audience. If you're doing it for God's glory and somebody hurts you. Oh, okay. Let's think about sports. You get in sports and you have that, that basketball player that shoots the shot and he think he get he thinks that he was fouled and he looks at the ref and says, why didn't you call the foul? 
But then he eventually runs down to the other end of the court because the game's not over. The goal is to win the game. I can't let just getting this foul call be my all in all. Like, no, that that's that's like have a big picture. Make sure you keep that proper perspective. If you're living to win the game, in this case, we're living for God. Um, I'll give a real personal testimony for a second. When I was young, I had a I had an unhealthy relationship with my father. Um, there was a time in, in my my youth, in my teenage years, I had some years where I literally in my heart felt like I hated my father. Mm. And my father was in my home. I, I grew up in a two-parent household, but I did not have a good relationship with my father. Wow. And I had to come to grips with, I'm saying I love God, but I hate my father. And I knew, I'm like, that's not right. And, and there was a process of healing I had to go through. There was a process of forgiveness I had to go through. And it wasn't pretty. Do you know where that where that journey started? It didn't start with, oh, I love my dad and he's great. No, that's right. not where it started. It started with, you know what? I love God and you're not important enough to hinder that relationship with him. Mm. And because of that, I choose not to hold on to this. Wow. Like, that's not pretty. You know what I'm saying? You don't hear people say that in church, but yeah. that's that was the start. I'm saying, I have to forgive you because I love God. And, and for some of you, you may have to start there and say, who is, am I really about God or am I really about me? Is mm. am I God or is he God? So if I love God, I'm going to put him first and I choose to forgive you because of the fact that I love God and, and feelings follow decisions. Feelings are fickle. So if I choose to forgive you and actively repeatedly start saying, I forgive you, the feelings catch up and it's like, you know what, eh. you know, at first it's, you're not worth it. And then it's, you know what, you're not that bad all of the time. And then it's, and then you eventually get to the place. And I, I realized, you know what, my dad did the best with who he was and where he was. Yeah. And I was able to understand and respect and love him for who he was and not just remain hurt for who I wanted him to be. We get mm. all on father. We people with father issues now. My bad. But I nah, mean, you that's know, good, bro. And so it's like uh, we, we get that same thing in relationships in general to where we get caught up in people falling short of what we want them to be instead of being able to love them for who they are. There's mm. a reason why the Bible says to bear with one another. In love. I mean, just the wording makes it sound like this isn't going to be easy all mm. the time. There's going to be times where it's going to take some work. Yeah. So put in the work. Um, and lastly, in all thy getting, get an understanding. Get wisdom. Come on now. The Bible says to guard your heart with diligence, for out of it flows all the issues of life. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been hurt. Not necessarily church hurt, but I've been hurt to my core by people. I've been ripped up one side and down the other. Mm. And it'd be real easy to just make that other person the villain of my life, right? I'm yeah. the good, you know, they're the bad. And I had to realize that I am responsible for guarding my heart. That's my job. Yeah. I have to guard my heart because out of it flows all the issues of life. What does that mean? That means that my perception, how I view life, how I perceive things, how I take in life, is actually through, picture your heart being a looking glass. And if that looking glass is clean and pure and, and, and wiped, you can see life a lot clearer. Yeah. But if that looking glass is cracked all, all over the place, you can't perceive things very well. We have a lot of people walking through life with broken looking glasses because their hearts are broken because they haven't guarded their heart with diligence and they're still walking around blaming everybody else for hurting me. Come on. Forgetting that it's my responsibility to guard my heart. I can't get mad at a snake for biting me. A snake is a snake. It's my job to have the wisdom because I can, in all that getting, get an understanding. What's the yeah. old saying? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Like I have to have the wisdom to say, wait, I, this is, I'm managing this. I'm managing this heart. 
I have to guard my heart. So when I go to church, it doesn't mean that I can't be open. It doesn't mean that I can't love people because anytime you love people, you're opening yourself up to, to be hurt. That, that's, that just comes with the territory. Yeah. But it doesn't, when you keep things in proper perspective, it's brother, you're married. You, you love your wife with everything in you, but your wife ain't perfect. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I know there's time. I, you ain't got to nod, though. I want to get you in trouble. <laughs> I, know, I know there's times where your wife has hurt you. And you had to be like, oh, wait, this isn't a fairy tale anymore. Mm. She's a human, and I have to choose to forgive so that I can wow. continue to be in this relationship in the way. And so I, I use that same picture for the church and for those who may be dealing with church hurt. Just because you got hurt, it doesn't mean you just run away and you stop living life. Like, and you yeah. stop trying to live your best life, which is not forsaking the gathering of his people. I can't let, I can't put another per person so high up on a pedestal that I disobey God because of what you did. No one should have that much power. Mm. 